everybody. Welcome to The Hang featuring Nathan Grabiel, aka Saxologic. Yes, sir. Here yes, I sir. Am. Here I am. <laughs> hey, everyone. So, um, we're just going to be chatting today, talking about some different things, and uh, I think it's going to be pretty cool for you guys to see uh, Nathan and hear from him and hear what he has to say about different topics. And, uh, you know, I hope they learn something, either about you or about what you feel and, you know, both of us and how we both kind of feel about certain topics. Yeah, looking forward to it. <laughs> I have no idea what to expect. Uh, we'll <laughs> that see. is true. I, I don't really uh, ever screen questions by the people. So you don't know what I'm going to ask you. I have no idea. And what topics we're going to talk about. I'm a little scared. <laughs> <laughs> you should be. You should be. <laughs> so, uh, so first off, everybody watching this probably knows you but we have to do the, the typical thing of like if somebody doesn't if somebody's watching this right now and they don't know who you are like it's you know one of my family members watching this and they don't watch my channel ever oh. <laughs> but they happen to stumble across this one or someone else um, how would you describe yourself as a person how do you describe yourself as a musician and then how would you describe yourself as a content creator because for those who don't know he is a wonderful saxophonist, a wonderful musician in general, um, a wonderful content creator, decent person, but he's got two out of three. <laughs> you can laugh, it's okay, that was a joke. Oh. <laughs> Go, so yeah. No, so tell him about, you know, just about you in different ways if you want, you know. Okay, um, well, uh, my name is Nathan Grayville. I am right now a master's student at the University of Miami, the Frost School of Music. Um, been playing saxophone since I was in sixth grade, so I was 12. So this is my 12th year. I'm 24 now. Um, in person, I'm a lot more awkward, as, <laughs> as you'll get to see now. <laughs> but I, I've always been like this. Um, I'm the type of guy that switches hobbies a lot, you know. I remember at one point in my childhood, I was just obsessed with juggling forever. Yeah. It was really weird. And then after a month, I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> but I've always been like that. Um, when I was a kid, I was super obsessed with solving the Rubik's Cube as fast as I can and just going to school and challenging everyone. Cool. And then I um, went to all state competition and realized I wasn't cool because everyone <laughs> could do it. <laughs> yeah. See, it's funny. You say all state for Rubik's Cube. Oh no, all state for sax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All state, yeah. And then they could all do the Rubik's Cube too? Yeah, yeah. I really? Like, I'll bring it. And they're like, oh, I have one too. I was like, <laughs> okay. now wait a minute, was that all state classical? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes a little more sense. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So, no, I'm going to let you keep going in a second, but it just, just brought me. So it sounds like it's it's interesting these, these hobbies you're saying, like Rubik's Cube, you know, juggling, very like tactile things do this very specific thing juggle the specific thing there's no subjectivity in solving a Rubik's cube you do or you don't right like yeah. I don't know I'm like that was um, that was basically a literal question oh. <laughs> it wasn't a rhetorical oh. question is oh. it is it basically like um well the same algorithms would work I mean there's gonna be a million different contexts but the same objective same object so get it to the same on all the sides mm -hmm. pretty much. cool interesting yeah. Yeah. I, all right, keep going. Oh, sorry, you oh, can keep going on that. That's no, cool. All good. I used to, my first dream when I was growing up was to have my own TV show. Like yeah. Like an animated TV show. And so I, I used to draw a lot. I have some drawings over there if you want to see them. Yeah. Let's go get them. Um, drawings. Drawings. <laughs> drawings. I used to have a giant catalog when I was younger. I used to make comic books. And I still have all of those, but they're in North Carolina. But um, I have to like over 40. They're just something so cool to me about just literally creating your own world. You know, you could create, you just use your imagination. If you want some guy flying on a dragon going to school, you could just create that. You know, I'm just so fascinated by that. Yeah. I, um, but here's some drawings. I used to have a, a giant list, or list. I used to have a, like a giant catalog basically all my drawings like from my very first all the way up to like 10 plus years but um i kept it in my band locker in middle school and a janitor went through the lockers and threw it away no so that was a big blow to now wait a minute though hold on 
Hold on, everybody's everybody's getting all upset at the janitor. When was this? Like over the summer, on a weekend. Uh, when was this? Oh yeah. I don't know. Because what I, <laughs> I'm just saying this as a band director. So many kids leave so much stuff in their cubbies that we're like, all right, this weekend we're cleaning them out. This summer can't leave anything in. So I, <laughs> yeah, it, I think it was irresponsible. I didn't have a lock on, and it, I, it was in there like oh, all. Oh, you guys actually had like locker locker for the instruments. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. It was oh. Interesting. Oh. Yeah. Darn. <laughs> I was halfway joking with you about like you know. Saying it's your fault, but no. I mean, it probably was my fault. I should have. <laughs> it's so sacred to me. I should have kept it somewhere sacred. But learning so, so these are all from after that, obviously. Yeah. Um, some cool. of these are average. I, mean, I don't really like that. Um, there's just you a show, sleeve. Can you show the camera. Oh, sure. Uh, here's a sleeve. Um, here's Link. I was too scared to draw the face because I thought everything else was good. If I drew the face, hey, I'll ruin it. That's it. You know, a, a, a good way to piss people off is call Link Zelda. I love that. <laughs> I do that. So my wife <laughs> was really, you know, is really into video games and stuff and I'd be like, oh, there's Zelda. <laughs> that's so mad. That's good. Yeah, it's good. It's good times. Do that at home, kids. It'd be a lot of fun. Call Mario Luigi. Oh, God. <laughs> so full Metal Alchemist character. Cool. Man. I drew the... That's a pretty straight lines you drew there. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. Um, this is a Dragon Ball Z character. He's the god of destruction. <laughs> okay, Lord Beerus. Yep, that's cool. Uh, that was 2019. Sweet. And this is my latest one. This is 2020, November 27th. 2020. This is right after I finished this anime, Hunter x Hunter. So Nice. I don't draw that's very awesome. Long. Thanks, man. So, so you're drawing these from a specific picture, or no? That's yeah. From, oh, okay. Mm, I would use it as a reference. Nice. Uh, yeah. See, that's so so interesting, right there. Just like the hobby aspect, like you're doing the tactile things, and now that, which obviously drawing can be super subjective, right? Like you can, if you're just creating any character you want, like you were saying, it, riding a dragon, going to school. So you have that, but you can also like say I want to be able to draw this specific style and I know nothing about drawing so forgive me but like if there's a you know and this specific anime has a specific style where the lines are thicker or the hair is a certain way and the eyes are you're trying to like transcribe and like learn that style right Absolutely. like as you because you can't just like you know I mean if you don't do it in the right style it's not going to look like the picture and those look real legit to me so Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. yeah, that's absolutely the case. Like, especially with the animes I watched growing up. I remember I was just so attached, and it was weird, like loyal to the Dragon Ball Z style. Yeah. So any other style, I was like, nope, not as good. Like Naruto, I was like a Naruto <laughs> hater for so long. Uh oh. I was like Dragon Ball Z. Go in the comments, guys. <laughs> All the Naruto lovers, tell him he's wrong. <laughs> I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, so, with that, then talking about still the drawing thing you know that style that you like does that then influence your own style when you just draw not from a specific thing like you create your own thing is that now like you know everybody has their own style but you got to have an influence from something right yeah definitely it definitely influenced and also like at least from what I can remember you also try to avoid things because you don't want to be a copycat you know, like the way I would draw my eyes on my own characters. Um, the temptation was to draw it like Akira Toriyama, the Dragon Ball Z creator. Mm -hmm. I was like, no, I gotta have my own thing. And then if you look at animes, they all drew it pretty similar. I was like, well, what would be my own thing? You know, because like one day I gotta have my own TV show. That's right. Gotta be coffee. You know? <laughs> yeah. So originality was a, a huge thing. Um, That's cool. Even though it's, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of similarities between that and improvising, right? Oh. Like, think about that. I mean, we're, we didn't even get into the, any music stuff yet, but just thinking about the similarities between having an inspiration, having something to first, you know, uh, copy, if you will, copy that style, think about copying the way someone plays, mm -hmm. and then how can we, like we were talking about before we turned the camera on, about taking one idea, but how do you make it your own? How do you edit that and manipulate that sound? to make it your own. I guess you can do the same thing drawing. Like, okay, 
that's the way they draw hair or their hands or, you know, whatever. But how can I take maybe a little bit of the way they draw their hair and, and the way this person draws eyes and this person draws their, I don't know, whatever. So mm-hmm. that's cool. That's yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. For sure. And there are some things I never got good at. And just like with jazz, like to really get free with stuff, mm-hmm. you just got to practice it in all different contexts, you know? Yeah. So like to draw a body from like this angle and then that angle and then this angle and this pose, it was just, there's a lot more work to have been done if I huh. like, d- didn't let go for sure. That's so cool. Yeah, Good to know this thing. So that was, those are your main, I guess like the hobbies that kind of keep you going. Well, the, the first two were when you were younger. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. do you, so you don't do uh, any juggling anymore? I can still do it. Good. <laughs> but cool. Uh, Did you juggle like different objects and stuff too? Like, yeah, I'll try. I mean, I, oh, didn't, cool. I didn't get amazing at it compared to like professionals. Oh. But I just want to be uh, better than my brothers. Yeah. At it. Yeah. <laughs> and are you? Yeah, but they literally don't care. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's okay. It doesn't matter. You don't yeah. have to tell everybody else that. You can tell them, you know, your brothers really care a lot and you're just better. No. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. <laughs> exactly. So you got that the drawing thing going on. So is the drawing thing, once again, another thing we were talking about before is having an assistant not an escape, but having a balance. Is drawing one of those things that you can do to balance your playing, like balance playing saxophone? So like you go so hard because, well, you you were starting to talk about your your lineage of, of playing saxophone, I think, but tell them what you're doing now with saxophone real quick before I talk about this next topic. Like, what are you doing? Like, are you in school right now? Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> like that, that's what I mean. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, right now, I'm in school. I, I got my bachelor's on a double major in classical saxophone and jazz saxophone, both performance. Now, um, I started jazz later. I started jazz really in, in college outside of Billy's Bounce. <laughs> <laughs> for the like auditions and stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Much. And um, so because of that, I just felt like I was, and I still feel like this, I'm just in this, this state of, I need to catch up, I need to catch up. And so that's why I did my master's here in, um, or sorry, that's why I did my master's in jazz here at the Frost School of Music. In what school? What university? Oh, at the university. <laughs> that's why I did my master's at the University of Miami at the Is that Frost. how you do it? Is oh, yeah. The U? Yep, that's it. <laughs> uh, that's, that's awesome. That's oh, it's like, oh, it's like that. Uh-huh. Oh. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> oh, I tried it. Both work. Both yeah, yeah. They'll take both. And are you going to be continuing your schooling? Yeah, the original plan was no, <laughs> but um, I got a really cool offer, and um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be in classical sax. And I, I feel like you can't really learn classical sax on the streets, you know? <laughs> you can't have the crazy community. <laughs> If there's, if there's one place I'm going to polish it, it will have to be in academia. And so mm-hmm. if they're going to give a full offer and a siphon, it's hard to say no. Well deserved. Oh, thanks. I mean, that's so like someone like you who is very good at the saxophone, you've dedicated a ton of hours to it, mm-hmm. right? You went bachelor's degree, dual major, uh, master's, you're finishing up now gonna do a doctorate, right? This is all like intense stuff. What I was bringing up before is, like these hobbies, like I guess drawing now is the, the bigger one. Like does that, is that help to have that balance, to have that time off for you? Um, or, cause I know some people that, you know, they, they, they would rather do little bits of time off, like, like only a couple hours in the day, they do something else and they get right back to it. Or do you say, you know what, for this whole weekend, I'm gonna just like, not play saxophone and maybe do either something that just I enjoy or a hobby or whatever. Like, how do you approach the balance aspect oh. to, and that could be like, and I'm, I'm obviously if you have like a concert coming up and you have something specific, you know, but if you're just, if it's just like a general thing, do you take time off? Do you do these hobbies to break up your time? Okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, nowadays I don't really draw much, but my main hobby now is honestly Super Smash Brothers. There's a lot of tournaments in the area. Mm. People are very serious about the game. <laughs> yeah. And um, if you get good enough, you can like win money. And, and I, I used to win tournaments in North Carolina very often, but 
over here they're just way too good yeah there's people that play this game eight hours a day and they're not in school for anything and a lot of them um, are in high school so as soon as they come home from school they just play this all day <laughs> but um it's it's still nice to have something else that i'm good at that i can use in it as an escape now in terms of um balancing it at all i don't know if i'd be a, a great role model you know well you know for sure we're just trying to f find out what you do so what do you do yeah um so <laughs> i'll either play smash brothers in the morning or at night and just stay up way too late because of it and i regret it every time <laughs> <laughs> um but uh, it's also a great reason to hang out with friends. You know, there's the Smash community is pretty cool. I'm, I've met a lot of people that I would have never met if it wasn't for it. And um, it's just nice to hang out late with your boys. You know. And, um, oh, I don't play, so he's looking at me. Oh, <laughs> you were like, yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh good. I'm just messing with you. Yeah. But I don't play. I, I think I played it once. I was terrible at it. Oh. Yeah, that's okay. I guess that's like saying, you know, I tried jazz once. I was really bad at it. <laughs> Never going to do that again. I don't touch the stuff anymore. No more jazz. So your balance isn't that great then. Yeah, I, I feel like, well, maybe it's because... Or does it work for you? Yeah. I want to say it works for me, but I have that voice in the back of my head from my undergrad professor who's, who's just a master of time management. Mm -hmm. you know, he would schedule his hour to the minute, or every hour to the minute. And he had me doing that at one point. And at one point, I'd say the longest I was able to pull it off was for like two months. I was waking up at 5 a.m. I knew what I was going to do at 6 a.m. I knew what I was going to do at 7.35 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> and um, wow. that was for a preparation of a concerto competition. And um, I ended up winning that competition. I was the first saxophonist to win that and at that school for Congratulations. over a decade. Thank you. So obviously that worked and you kept that for the rest of your life, right? That schedule. Oh, uh, no, not <laughs> really. <laughs> so yeah, when I was over, I was like, oh, I'm gonna take a break. And then the break never ended, you know? That's so funny. See, it's so interesting to hear because like, you know, people have different theories on this and everybody, everybody thinks their way, well, everybody either thinks their way is the best or they know their way isn't good and they're like, screw it, I just wanna do it anyway. You know, and that's kind of what it sounds like you are now with the video games late at night, and you're like, "I'll let future Nathan take care of this." Yeah, pretty you know. Much. Well, you're you're still young. You're 24. When you get a little bit older, sleep. I noticed that was for me. Sleep is the one thing that now, if I get a messed up sleep schedule, it's bad. Okay. That's the only thing. I feel great. I feel like I did when I was 20 years old, except for sleep. Oh man. So uh, yeah, it's interesting. So you know. I didn't say that because I want you to tell the kids to do that, or you're going to be as successful as he is if you do that, but it's just different strokes for different folks, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. everybody has their own thing. Um, yeah, I would say I'm a very spontaneous kind of person. Yeah. You know, I, I will make a decision when we, uh, I cross the bridge when, when I get there, basically. Nice. You know? And now, is that the, so that's for life, but is that for you, like, practicing and stuff too? Mm -hmm. Do you just kind of, like feel it out like I want to practice or I don't or is it was that a little more regimented mm, I try to practice every day um, even when I really don't want to I'll at least just try to pick up the horn and do something because I know like a lot of that is just the resistance of just starting but mm. even I mean I find that no matter how much I don't feel like doing it if I just play for 10 minutes pretty soon that feeling goes away and mm. you get lost in it nice um, that's a good tip I think for people is, and it, it's it's this little saying that the hardest thing about writing a book is sitting down to write a book. Mm. The first word on the page. Mm. Once you get going, you know, some people psych themselves out before they do anything. Mm. Like paralysis by analysis kind of, but I, I know I'm that way with certain things where, like, like for example, emails. <laughs> I'm sure some people watching this are probably like, you haven't answered my email. Yeah, <laughs> but like I see a, my inbox full and I just let it go and and the more it grows the more I don't want to attack it and I'm like this is good and then when you finally do it I get through it and rip through it really quick I'm like oh that wasn't so bad hmm. I'll definitely be better next time <laughs> and then you're not right yeah. it's just like anything else like oh, I don't want to go to the doctor I don't want to go to the dentist I don't want to do these things that you need to do <laughs> and the the stress of thinking about it ahead of time or like oh, I don't want to do it 
is worse and ends up consuming more time than just doing the activity, whether it's work or, you know, practice or whatever you have to do. Um, so I think that's, you know, like you said, you, you start playing for 10 minutes and it goes away. You're like, oh yeah. Yeah. I love this, you know? Oh, yeah, for sure. And that's so interesting that you bring that up because I've been thinking about, you know, why do we delay some stuff? And I still don't really know, but I think about it every day and I notice like, I'll get the stuff that I'm procrastinating on done when I'm using that thing to procrastinate <laughs> with. You know? so, so you just push it off to the next thing. Yeah, so if I'm like, um, so if I'm putting off this dentist appointment, but then all of a sudden um, my dad wants me to cut the grass, all of a sudden I'm like, I gotta go to the dentist, you know? <laughs> so it's like a hierarchy of procrastination. It's Love kind of it. weird how that works. That is very funny. <laughs> I like that. And, you know, eventually, at least you're not letting them all build up. Because that's one thing, too. And you can probably speak to this really well, being in grad school right now. You have a lot of responsibilities. You know, you have to go to classes. You have to go to lessons. You have to do all this stuff. We're not even getting into the content creation, your own uh, business of Saxologic and Nathan Graybill Online. But just that part of it, of being in school and having to do all these things... It's good that at least even if you're procrastinating something, you're fill, you're you're procrastinating it by filling in with something else to push that one thing off. It's you're not just piling it up. Yeah. Because like could you like you know, I I could only imagine going back, you know, thinking about school, if I had to do all the things you have to do, plus you have 18 other things that were supposed to be done by today and you didn't do them yet. Mm -hmm. That's got to be like weight oh. and like yeah. like crushing down. Uh-huh. And I I think that's probably a large part of the equation. I think there's just, I mean, there's, I bet there's like at least 20 things I need to do today. But <laughs> yeah. I just know that. But we're just sitting here chatting about stuff instead. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I just, I feel like the brain has a way of organizing what it's gonna prioritize the most. And I think a lot of it's just emotional regulation, really. Hmm. Like whatever's gonna stress me out the least right now. But I have the least resistance. Yeah, yeah, but it's definitely not always a good thing, you know, because yeah. putting it off now will make it worse later. And yeah. I'm, but I'm, I'm figuring it out. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody is. Yeah. And that's the thing. That, that's the cool thing you, you bring that up because I think some people, well, I, I know some people when they see um, someone in media or they see someone in movies or they see someone online and they see someone that they look up to or whatever, they assume certain things about them good and bad right mm -hmm. so like with you you're in grad school you're doing all this stuff you make all these great videos you play music you wrote a pdf book you do all these things right mm -hmm. people might think like man you're so regimented you're scheduled you must be so strict you must be so but then like you're saying it's the complete opposite oh yeah so it's interesting <laughs> to know that's and that's what that's why i'm glad we're talking about this because it's cool for people to understand there's more than maybe one way to do it mm -hmm. Not that, it's, yeah. not that maybe your way is the best way or not. You know, I'm not judging. I'm just saying, don't go out and tell your parents, hey man, hey mom, dad, I can stay up till four in the morning playing video games and I can still be successful. So I don't have to go to school anymore because Sax Saxologic stays up till four in the morning playing <laughs> and he's super successful. They, uh, then they're gonna, you're gonna get an email from someone's parent <laughs> being like, why'd you tell him to do this? So it's not what he's saying, you know. Yeah. And, it, and you know, I'm a, being a teacher, I don't want kids to always think one thing and then just do it because it's they think it's going to work for them you figured out that this as of right now works for you and i think it's working for you it seems like it is oh thanks man <laughs> yeah I, I would say that you know no matter at least for me no matter where i am i'm always going to be comparing myself to the the, the thing that could be higher mm -hmm. so i mean it's it's interesting hearing you or anyone talk about my accomplishments because it's so easy to, to forget because you should put them on your wall <laughs> maybe so oh, i'm just saying oh. just throwing it out there <laughs> oh, <it's serious. laughs> that's funny thank you sorry keep going oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean nowadays i i feel like i'm the one that's behind because like the players at this school can play in a way that i really wish i could and I know that it's just simply going to take many years before I get there. But I know after many years, I'm going to be wishing I did something else, you know. Maybe I'll be wishing 
I had a family and kids. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I will. But Who knows? And that's it, it's it's funny you bring that up because I want to start talking about the more music side of things. Okay. Um, you say you're always you know you're looking at these other players or something and they're they're really good and you want to be like them. You know that there's a lot of people that say the exact same thing about you, right? They're like, you're so good. I want to be as good as you. Mm. And then those people you're looking up to are probably looking up to someone else saying, I want to be as good as them, mm. right? So we're, I, for, I'm not trying to like preach to you or anybody else, but like, but when you say that, and I hear people say that, there's no defense in music, right? Everybody's on their own lane. We might be going different speeds. Mm. People may have started in front of you, had a head start. You know, you said you started playing saxophone when you were 12 years old. Mm-hmm. So that's late for saxophone. Now, is starting at 9 or 12 going to affect your professional career when you're in your 20s and 30s and 40s? Probably not, but it might. I don't know. So, you know, don't, you know, you, you, it's great to have something to look forward to or look look towards and say, I want to be as good as them and keep, keep raising your own standard. We were talking about before, like raising the bar. If you compare yourself to how you were a year ago or two years ago or three years ago, you'd probably say you're, this is probably roughly the best version of yourself as a musician right now right mm. oh yeah uh, maybe maybe not you know yeah. but it's one of those things that's uh it's good that you always say all right i'm working towards this goal now they're up here and i'm working here and here and you're always chasing that chasing that carrot out in front of you of, of things that's cool yeah. and that's good it's, it's a healthy thing to have because complacency is what kills careers complacency is what kills drive complacency is what kills you know, just, just the whole reason why we do this, the love of music and the love of anything, any hobby. If you're like, yeah, I'm good enough. Okay, cool. It, <laughs> now, now what, right? You just, what's the point anymore? Um, so, yeah. So, musically, so you started playing playing saxophone. Uh, you say you didn't start jazz until college, really? I mean, uh, yeah. like, well, did you we play did. in like a high school jazz band? I did, but, I mean, all the solos were written, you know. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, the only solo that was listen written. hold on hold on I'm not going to ask what your name is uh, band director at Nathan Graville's high school please stop having kids play written solos thank you yeah. I always tell kids I'd rather hear a bad solo that's yours than a good solo that you read mm. now obviously there's exceptions like Oh, we're starting with the written solo to see how it works through the changes, and then we're going to edit it and and make maybe play the written solo for first measure. I'll improvise bar two, play the written solo third measure. Mm. Did you do that, or did you just play the written solo top top to bottom? Oh, I just played the written solo top to bottom. Yeah, for sure. Brutal. Okay, keep going. So that was your first jazz experience, really? Yeah, and other than that, we would improvise over the blues, but he had taught us like play the blues scale for every chord, like D seven, mm. D seven blues. G7, play the G7 blues, and then... Really? Uh, cool. A7, play the A7 blues. Man. Just blue scale all over. And it was just that oh, key. No. And the key of B flat. Solid. It was pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I did go to a um, uh, high school band camp that senior year, though. And that's those videos are on my channel. And Ooh. so I would... All I knew about improv at that point was just what I saw on YouTube videos, and I, it's probably why I really like doing YouTube because I think of that person I was. You know, like YouTube was like all I had. I never had taken private lessons up from that point. Yeah. You know, so I was, you know, that's definitely a motivation for a lot of stuff. Yeah. So you see, so like when you're making videos now, you're thinking of yourself, putting yourself in that place of of the the consumer, the watcher, the listener. Absolutely. Of like, how would I entertain this person? How can I teach this person or whatever? Yeah, that's definitely. good. That's a really good mindset to have. Very, very good in anything. That's a really good mindset to have. Oh, thanks. Yeah, there's just I never could have um, afford lessons. I mean, I never had a, like a real job till like way later. And my parents, I don't know. It's just not even something I even thought about. It's like, do I even need lessons? I mean, and when I thought of lessons, I just thought of like. Yeah, it's a horrible way to think of it, but at the time, all the people that took lessons in my area, they were just like the snooty kids that I didn't <laughs> aspire to be like, you know? I was like, ew, I don't want to be like them. I yeah. don't need lessons. <laughs> but now, now... Now you play that character. <laughs> so maybe, maybe there's there's some real life people when you play that character. Oh, yeah. That, that, you, know, you, know the, you know that classical snob? 
Oh, <laughs> that, that really comes from my undergrad. Oh. Uh, and He's calling everybody out. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's I, good. I could really go in about that. Oh, okay. we'll get there in a second. Okay. I wanted to ask you a question, just a straight up question. Who are some of your favorite musicians of all time that are not saxophone players? Oh. It could be any style, it could be any, like, it could be pop music, it doesn't matter. Just like not, because I, I think as a instrumentalist, we get so caught up in like listening to other alto saxophone players mm -hmm. that we hear, you know, all the variations that they do. But, but the thing is, usually the lineage ends up being the same. It's the same path. It's like, oh, it comes from, you know, this to this to this. And they listen to the same people this other alto player listened to without a lot of variation. Mm. Okay? The gene pool is very small, you know? Yeah. So, like, it's like some non-saxophone players. Yeah. Um, growing up, I really liked uh, Steve I. Mm. Because my dad was a guitar player, and he, okay. he turned me on to them, or to him. And yeah, he, had, he has this album. I think it's called Little Green Men. And when I was younger, I just loved that album. So that's one. That's awesome. Um, I I'd listened to a lot of alternative rock. <laughs> it's probably just because my brother, um, we shared a room growing up, and so he would have his, uh, I believe it was Spotify, and he would have his music on, and so I just listened to whatever he listened to. So like bands like Blink One Eighty Two, honestly, um, Disturbed, Breaking Benjamin, um, Good Charlotte. You know, I, I had a. Uh, guitar Hero, so I got into a lot of songs from them, uh, Ben Sevenfold. Um, I never really got that deep into rap. I remember at one point I really liked J. Cole. Maybe part of that is just because he was from North Carolina. He was like, literally just, his school was just like 20 minutes away from my school. So mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, J. Cole, fine. <laughs> so yeah, I really liked him. Um, that's what comes to my mind. Um, right now, but I'm sure there's more. Yeah, but awesome. Yeah, I mean that's. I think that's important too because there's some people who only listen to the style of music that they play, mm. which first of all is, is probably not good because you're pigeonholing yourself into one style of playing. You should be playing multiple styles too. So it's like I only play jazz saxophone, swing saxophone. That's all I listen to are jazz saxophone players. Mm. You're not bringing any, you know, anything in there because if you ask. It, it always comes back to, you know, transcribing and listening and talking. If you ask, you know, Vincent Herring, the alto player, who'd you listen to? You know, he's going to say some names that aren't just jazz saxophone players. Hmm. He's going to say, you know, oh yeah, Freddie Hubbard, probably. He's going to say, you know, some some of the trumpet players. He's going to say, you know, all the, the classic musicians that we know and we love and everything, but on different instruments because they, they know the the value of that. And I think it's funny, Vincent, speaking of Vincent, because I studied with him in college, he used to actually teach a, when he would do like some master classes at different places, I saw a syllabus, and one of them was all about Miles Davis. It was like, I, I forget exactly what the thing, it was like why Miles is so important to music or why his playing was so influential or something like that. Mm -hmm. And think about that. It's a saxophone player doing a master class, a whole part of it on a trumpet player. Now, obviously, Miles is like transcends the trumpet, but you know. So I think it's good to to not only, and that's still in the jazz world. When you're talking about Avenged Sevenfold, that's obviously going to be different than the jazz world. Oh, yeah. But do you feel like that, like, inf well, had the influence in some way? But do you feel like, or how did it influence you as a musician, you as the performer of music on whatever instrument, any style? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, I feel like. I feel like it's influenced a lot. Um, another person I really listened to a lot uh, growing up was, at one point, was Mozart. Yeah. So I had a huge passion for Mozart. I, I still do, but it was especially uh, crazy back then because um, he, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but he had an iodidic memory. Is that how you say it? Uh, I'm not even sure. <laughs> it's basically like a photographic memory, but the, the video version. Oh. So he could he could compose an entire symphony in his head and like write it in like 30 minutes. So he was just a freak of nature. And um, so his his melodies to me really felt like a part of him. It didn't feel like he was like experimenting. 
it was just like just came from his genius you know <laughs> and so when I and what I liked about his melodies was that they're just so simple but so catchy like I could hum it for the rest of the week really and I just thought there was something really powerful about saying so much with just so few notes you could he could develop an entire theme on it and so I feel like that's what I really like in a solo I'm I'm whenever a saxophone player is just playing crazy like last month I was I was at a performance and there was these saxophone players and they're all performing together and they were just going off the whole time just and they're playing notes that I will probably never be able to play. I mean, I hope I will be able to, but they were just going off. They're very good players, but I just got so bored of it, you know. Um, I just, it's just not what my, it's just not what I like to hear. I don't, I don't care when someone's just displaying, like, hey, look, look how many notes I can play. You know, like, look at me. When I think of the song, and I, I'm trying to like learn out of this because I know to enjoy jazz to the fullest, I can't really think like this um, all the time. But when I think of a song, I try to listen to the product. Like I don't necessarily care. And like I said, I'm trying to learn out, of, learn my way out of this. I don't necessarily necessarily care how it got there or what it took. I'm just caring like what is the song as a product and what does it do to me like. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of the, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of misalignments I have with jazz and maybe it's just cause I started so late and this is a whole topic in mm-hmm. itself and I'm almost a little nervous to talk about this, you know? Yeah. Uh huh. But, um, um, was, I, yeah, okay. I'm not a huge fan, um, in terms of jazz of how people shun like popular music and say like oh well people just don't know what good music is nowadays <laughs> i just feel like if three billion people watched a song <laughs> and we're gonna say that we know better than this song that has managed to bring together three billion people because there's something in that song that is attracting something so universal that's able to attract that many people there's probably some value in there, you know. Yeah. And if a if a giant step solo for eight courses can only attract four hundred views after nine years, it was, it was on YouTube. Why are you talking about my channel like that, man? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I I'm just very reluctant to be like, oh well, we have the elite taste of music. I just feel like, you know, jazz in my opinion, it doesn't have to be dead. It didn't have to die. Or, and it's not, it's not really dead. But um, I really think it could be popular again. But as long as we're going to, you know, do a million thousand choruses and just shred and play as many notes, I feel like it is, I mean, no one, before I played saxophone, I never wanted to listen to stuff like that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I feel like if you have to learn how to listen to a song, you've already missed you've already missed the ball, you know. It becomes an exercise. Yeah, you sh- I, I feel like it should be just so innate, like so instinctual. It's so interesting, and I, by the way, I 100% agree with all this, and I, you know, we can riff on this for a long time. It, it, when, whenever somebody says that, right, what, what you say, the counter argument ends up being from the, the jazz snobs is one, you know, well, why do we have to play boring stuff? Well, so we want to play faster. We, we have the technique. We should be able to play fast. And it's not even about doing it because, for example, I love Metallica, right? Kirk Hammett was a guitar player. He would shred. But, and people would love it, right? And if you want to dissect his solos, they're, they're actually, there's a lot of stuff there, right? And he's playing a lot of notes, but it serves the purpose of the tune. Yeah. And, and you know, it fits the context. So when they're playing Enter Sandman, Right, it's building to this climax, and and when he plays fast, it's not playing fast just to play fast. It's playing fast because that's what what's called right. Mm-hmm. Just like if you're playing like a jump swing song, playing whole notes over that might not be the best choice. You might need to play faster, but the problem becomes when you start putting you just shoehorning this style that 
probably shouldn't be there <laughs> into this thing just because it's I learned all these licks. Look at all these licks I can play. I'm gonna play Coltrane Changes over Mary Had a Little Lamb for these fourth graders. Ah! <laughs> and that's exactly what you're saying, where you were like bored or whatever listening to those people play. And yeah, it, it's because they didn't fit the context. It doesn't mean fast playing can't be good. Some people, you know, like Michael Brecker, even when he played like with James Taylor and Joni Mitchell and all these other people, he would still throw in a couple lines here and there that were fast, but it served a purpose, right? To like yeah. to bridge to somewhere else or just a flurry of notes, but it it always has that balance. Mm. I, I don't know how you feel about this, but I always like to use analogies and I always say like texture in food, food analogies are big for me, but so texture in food is kind of like that. If you had a, an appetizer that was mushy and your entree was mushy and your dessert is mushy, it's like, <laughs> It's a little too much, right? Yeah. But on the on the flip side, if you had a crunchy, 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 it's too much too. Texture variations are good. So playing really fast all the time, even if it's killer lines, like yeah. well, it doesn't. It, you're, it's almost like when you play loud all the time, it loses its effect. The best way to make loud sound loud is to make soft sound softer, mm. right? It's it's that it's that relationship the, the how relative they are to one another so it's great to hear you say that and and I I mean this not to say like I'm that much older than you but I'm 10 years older than you it's nice to hear a younger musician who's in college who's in it you're in this world this and you grew up with Instagram and YouTube and all this stuff to say hey wh why are you just doing all chops it's so cool to hear you like say that oh thanks you. you know and I don't mean to offend Zach when I say chops. <laughs> chops are good a lot of the time. <laughs> chops, chops are cool, but pocket pays the bills. <laughs> you know, but uh, you know, it's it's funny. It's it's great to hear you say that. Mm. And and it comes out in your playing. And for those of you, like a lot of you know Nathan as maybe a YouTuber, but like you're a great musician. Like oh, that's you. that's why I think the core is. It's just you also have a sense of humor and you also do all these other cool things. That just add on to it, which build the saxologic world. I think. Oh, thanks. So. Um, yeah, no. I'm just, listen. I'm just calling it like I see it. I don't lie. So <laughs> I'm just telling you what I see. So with that being said, so it's it's great that you feel that way about it. And like I said, it comes across in your playing, um, very thoughtful playing and melodic and and all that good stuff that you want to hear. How did the transition to like making YouTube videos? So this is like a, it's like a harsh transition here away from that specific topic, but like so you you make YouTube videos now that aren't just you aren't a musician who just posts videos from your concerts on YouTube and that's that's it. You make videos specifically for YouTube, right? Did you initially go into YouTube because I know you've made you've put up videos on when you were young, right? <laughs> so did you always make videos for YouTube? with the purpose of I want to make a video for YouTube or was it one of these things where like I did this thing and I happened to film it and where can where should I put it oh I'll put it on YouTube like by happenstance or like what is it for you or what and it could change like what was it um, I think this this hobby is very connected to probably just a core part of who I am so I used to be an animator and mm. not like a professional I used to just spend like eight hours a day animating it was part of my dream of, of being a cartoon or having a cartoon show yeah. and uh, the software I would use is on a Nintendo DSi it's like it's a DS with the camera on it a yeah, DSi. Yeah, yeah okay and um, there's a program on there called flip note studios and so on that you could make an animation and then you could post it online and you had a profile and then it would just be open to the world and then um, there was a popular page list and you could get followers uh, on there they call them fans and um, so I would go to the most popular and you know there's all kinds of styles but then you'd see one style that really resonates with you and you're like whoa I want to make stuff like that yeah you know so I would use them as my inspiration and I would like study every frame and I would just really I didn't realize it at the time but I was practicing because it was just I was so interested. I was like, "Wow, you can really make that!" And I, I made stick fight animations. Nice. And I made like over two hundred. They're all wow. gone now, sadly. Oh no! That that program uh, shut down. Oh. But um, when I was twelve, I ended up having eight thousand fans, which is a lot on that program. And um, I used to make tutorials, and they would get 
a lot. You, their like button was stars. Mm-hmm. You could add as many stars as you wanted, and you could buy fancy stars. You could buy like purple stars. You yeah, know, they'd be more expensive. So I would get like some purple stars on there, some blue stars. And, nice. Um, I remember my highest tutorial had like two hundred thousand stars. Whoa. And um, it was just, it was a lot for that program. Yeah. And so I think just that aspect of putting stuff out there and then seeing your own profile and building this portfolio and how it's just basically looking at your own evolution. Cause you, you scroll all the way to the back and you see like how bad you were and you didn't realize it at the time. You thought, you always <laughs> thought you're, you're pretty decent and you're just having fun. And then you fast forward to your stuff like currently and you're like, wow, I've come so far. But even then you would just watch every single one of your, your animations because it was just like you made this you like at one point you put your heart and soul into it and so mm-hmm. for that reason it will always be interesting to you i think youtube is the same way um i haven't gone through all my videos in a long time and just watched them all but yeah um sometimes like when i'm when i'm on a long road trip and i'm falling asleep something that really keeps me up is like let me just watch some of my videos let's see what i used to <laughs> you know and um now is that because you're you're trying to be critical of them or what no like, um it always came from a space of just like i mean sometimes i am critical but f- to me it feels like the same as when i open up that book of drawings mm-hmm. it just feels like it feels like um an outlet for art really a okay. youtube channel feels like yeah. a portfolio like an art an artist portfolio oh, maybe it's it is. a very abstract way like in a video way i mean you you know like video editing you, yeah it takes hours and it takes effort mm-hmm. it takes creativity it takes thought and yeah. it's just nice to have something that lets you do that and lets you post it forever and lets people watch it and um it's an open portfolio yeah for people to see your work yeah it's, that's just as valid as anything else as valid as having art it's as valid as having recordings. You know, we were talking about this before too. You know, you don't have to validate yourself to anybody. And also, you shouldn't have to feel like you need to in order to feel a certain way. Like you, you did those videos because you enjoyed it. And now you, you're enjoying the success of it because you put the hard work in. Mm-hmm. But you don't need to necessarily have tons of things out there if you don't want to. You don't have to have do tons of albums you know, to feel like, oh, because I did that, now I'm the man, I'm really cool now, I'm this, I'm that, you know? So, you you do something like you are because you love it, and you work hard at it, it's a great combination. And then you, you know, you're smart about it too. So like, like that, you were talking about the the, the stick figure drawings, the stick, sorry, Mm -hmm. what's the proper term? I don't want to offend anybody. It's like stick figure animation. Stick figure animation, (laughs) not drawings. So, fast forward a little bit then, Let's let's get into first of all. Where does the name Saxologic come from? <laughs> um, so, excuse me. I used to have this Wii U. So my channel name was actually Project Idiot. When it was Project first. Idiot. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Why? Why was that? Why was that the name? <laughs> because my oldest brother Nick, he's the one that got me in the video editing. He was just always a computer geek. I was too young to know anything. He's <laughs> four years older than me, and. Um, I was 10 years old and he showed me, he's like, hey Nathan, watch this. And he had his own channel, it was called Project Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then um, I made mine Project Idiot. And I just thought it was so fascinating. Like, um, my brother would come in, he like, he would have us pretend we're fighting. And yeah. then he would put sound effects on it, like punches, and yeah. put like effects. It was all with Windows Movie Maker. Awesome. And I just thought it was the craziest thing. I was like, whoa, how yeah. did you do that? How did you do that? And how old are you at this time? I was 10. 10, okay. Yeah. So this is 14 years ago? Mm-hmm. So this is around 20, 2000 and, uh, what was that, 8? Eight? 8. Oh my god, you're young. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, wait, what was the question again? Well, I was just saying, where does Saxologic come from? Oh, okay. Like yeah. The name. Okay. Yeah. So. And then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So with this channel, um, I generally think if I, if I still only had a thousand subscribers, if I if I had 
10 subscribers today, I'd still be posting videos. I just mm -hmm. like making videos. They're fun. Yeah. It's just something really fun about getting a camera out, putting the footage on the computer. Nowadays, it's a bit more stressful because now you have to do a refined product. But anyway, um, well, real quick, b before we get into just the next thing, you talk about um, you the enjoyment of the process of the video creation. It has nothing to do with the content, just the video creation itself. Mm -hmm. I know for me, personally, I, l I, can, I can sit there and edit videos for like hours and hours and hours and hours, like straight, and just be totally locked in. I'm not sure exactly why. Maybe it's because it's like a new, for me, it was a new skill to learn. Like, you know, like playing saxophone, we've been doing it for so long at the, you know, whatever point or whatever content you're doing, usually you've been doing this thing for so long. For me, video editing was a very new thing. Only, you know, not that many years ago. It was very new. So when I would like, I love that process of, you know, taking this bit of content because any, like it, it all comes back to like how you, you promote yourself and how you, you package these skills. A lot of people can play. Coltrane licks. A lot of people can play like Charlie Parker. A lot of people can do this. How are you going to present it to the world in a unique way? And just by the nature of video editing and forming these videos, you can do more creative ways to present a topic that has been, you know, done a million times. Like it's like doing a new arrangement of a tune. You're taking a fresh take on something that's been done. So same thing with video editing. I think. I don't know. That's so. It's yeah. cool to hear you like the process. Because some people I know. Or like, oh god, like I just I don't want to edit. I hate it. Ugh, I just want to like just play my instrument, or if, even if it's not music, it's like I just want to do the thing and not worry about the editing. And like for me, that's like <laughs> it's like so much fun. Yeah, for sure. I think for me, it, it goes back to that that uh, instinct that I had, just this desire to create a world. Mm -hmm. Video editing, you can absolutely do that. Like, yeah. I feel like Saxologic is different than like Nathan Grayville. Right? Sure. A little bit. Nathan Grayville is a bit awkward and shy. But Saxologic, I put on a mic, picks up everything. I don't have to talk very loud. Um, <laughs> cut out all awkward moments. It's just it's fast paced madness. And it's just, it's very easy. Like this, and this, and this, <laughs> and this, and this, and this. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And uh, I know there's, you know, people out there that, think that's invalidating, you know, to not be 100% yours. But like I said, I'm all about the product. If, mm -hmm. if, if I have all these awkward silences, I know if I was the consumer, I would have clicked out because my attention span is kind of yeah. bad. But also, but like you said, the product, but it's not that you're not being yourself. It's just that you're trying to present a product that's a certain way that you want to see, that you want it to portray to people. So it like it's not like you're lying to people. It's not like you're saying this is how I am all the time, no matter what. No, you're just that'd be like you know if someone is an actor, they have to no, they they get into a character. It's the same way, I think. Yeah. Like you know. Yeah. And sure. not that you have to, not that you're not yourself on camera, but just by by nature of editing it or whatever. That's like saying uh, you can't mix your album. Oh, you recorded it and the drums are a little too loud. Sorry, you can't mix it. You can't balance the levels. Yeah. You know, like yeah, that would yeah. that would be ridiculous. Yeah, so it's the same thing with video editing. Like, that's cool. It's the use the tools available to make the best product you can. Yeah, absolutely. You know, totally. Like agree. it's like South Park. Their first their pilot episode they did with construction paper and stop motion for the whole thing. Now oh, they can wow. make an entire episode in five days because they you know it's all hmm. computer animated. I don't know that stuff, yeah. but like they're using tools that have been refined to make the product they want. Yeah. It's a very weird example, but I think it applies, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, All right, where'd Saxologic come from? Where'd oh, the name come from? Oh, okay. I keep derailing you, but that's what the hang's oh, about. It's just about talking oh, and, and just chatting. Yeah. This isn't a one, this isn't linear. <laughs> this is... Hey, all good, man, all good. Yeah, so we had a Wii U, and um, my brother's name on it was Drumlogic. So he made the first profile, I was like, well. But why, why, like, why Drumlogic? But his, his name in Halo, on um, his Xbox, his um, what's it called? Gamer tag was Snipe Logic. Just, what's with the lo oh, just? What's with all the logic? I don't get it. Like, is that a thing that I don't? Am I too old to understand this? No, not no. Okay, There's no, it, it just sounds cool. Okay, oh, there we go. So that's what I was asking. Yeah, yeah. He, okay. He was a sniper. He that was his thing on Halo, so he made a Snipe Logic. Snipe so logic. then he made his profile on Wii U Drum Logic. I was like, well, I play saxophone, saxophone logic, and that's how that started. 
and eventually I changed the channel name on my. It became my uh, username on everything. Mm. It became my um, username on RuneScape. It became my username on uh, the Nintendo Switch now. And then um, just long before that anyone know. That, sorry, long before anyone knew the name. Yeah. You know. So now it's sad yeah. logic. So that brings me to the next thing because we are we are running out of time. <laughs> um, and then we can talk for a long time, like about lots of topics and everything. Yeah. But I want to get into obviously why mo or how most people know you now, mm. probably right, is through your current iteration of Saxologic, the YouTube channel, mm. where you make excellent videos on a regular basis, semi regular basis. <laughs> right. Semi regular is a great term, by the way. I love okay. that. That just means inconsistent. I love that's what. <laughs> I, I try, <laughs> yeah. yeah, semi-regular, <laughs> weekly-ish. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, good. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, yeah, so you make these great videos, um, and and for those of you, once again, who if you if you hung around this long, you're either interested because you know them, or you're interested because you don't know them, and you're learning things, but so either way, um, your channel is cool, and I really like it because you do a great job of mixing, and I really appreciate this, of mixing serious, stuff and musical things with comedy right and and with humorous things and situations um so that i love that you know and and you know i'm a little bit biased but the uh the um uh the snob videos are excellent just excellent <laughs> they really are and and they're great because because there's a lot of truths in them a lot of people see it if they don't know the scene they're like ha ah, that's funny but people who know are like oh Ooh, that was a deep cut, you know, some of the things. So it's funny. Um, but your channel is, is known by a lot of people um, all around the world. How different is it now on the internet first? How different is it when you post videos now to a channel that gets as much attention as it does versus before when it didn't get as much attention? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um... I feel like nowadays, um, and maybe I'm, I do this to myself, I feel like I'm, I'm more in a box now. Um, back then I just put on a camera, the front cam, and then just like spend like 10 minutes editing it, and then boom, I just post it. You know? mm -hmm. In a horrible lit room, um, you know, I pick up the camera and I'm just like walking around with it. <laughs> nowadays, I feel like, you know, if, if I have 160,000 people watching, they deserve a better product, you know, <laughs> one with more effort in there. And so, um, I feel like now there's more pressure and I hate to think of it that way, but it, that is what it is. It feels like pressure. Mm -hmm. And, um, now is that pressure because you want to give them a good product or do you think the pressure comes from them? Um, or, I mean, I guess it could probably be a mix of the first one. Probably first one. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I really feel like my success, you know, quote unquote success, just happened on accident. <laughs> well, to me, I was just doing what I always did. I just always posted video long before I even knew you could get monetized. It was just a, a hobby, and then um, the Mario Kart leak went viral, and then people were like, "Hey, you should keep posting more." And so I started posting weekly. And I just, out of nowhere, I never would have thought I would have been in this position. You know, I have a, a really popular saxophone channel where I have a dedicated audience that come back every day. It's just kind of like this thing that, um, it's like a magnet. And I, I, I just naturally pulled towards it. But um, it is a, a different perspective. Now, when I make a video, I'm trying to please, I'm aiming to please an audience and that can make things hard sometimes because I have no practice in that. I was never thinking for the audience. I was more thinking of just like for the enjoyment of just output, you know, creative output of videos. Yeah. So I'm still trying to figure out the best way to go about. You know. Listen, man, you're doing a great job. I, I think you have the good outlook because you have a mix of you're doing it for yourself, you're doing it because it's fun. If it wasn't fun, I don't think you'd be doing it. But you're also doing it from the audience's perspective. What do they deserve? What do they want? What do I want them to have? 
what would be enjoyable and fair for them. And I think that's also what makes you a good musician too. Once again, going back to that jazz snob thing, a lot of jazz musicians play only for other jazz musicians or for themselves. They're not thinking about the audience. They're not thinking about how they perceive things. And, you know, it, that's also another topic. But the fact that you're successful with the videos, but you're still, like, having fun with it. It's not, it's not like, oh, man, look, he just sells out and does this thing just for views and it's, like, not whatever. It's still videos, I assume, you like to make that are fun for you and, uh, and then provide value as well. So... Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah, and we, we, I'm sure we can talk a million uh, more hours about this stuff, um, and I could sit here all day talking, but I think it's time to get some food. What do you think? Oh, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Hey, thanks so much for doing it. Dude, thank you. This man. has been Nathan Graybill, Mr. Saxologic. Obviously, his link's going to be down below. I'm sure you all know him, but go check him out. Subscribe. Check out his PDF. Anything else for um, the people? Um... Watch out for my inkling on Super Smash Brothers. Um, Ooh, <laughs> whatever he's just said. <laughs> awesome. See you guys later. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, if you wouldn't mind subscribing to my channel, although if you made it this far, I'm sure they probably are. And if not, well, thanks for watching this far. Um, check out all the other things I have on my channel. Lots of different kinds of videos. Uh, in the top of the description down below, I have a free masterclass, how to create uh, melodic solos. And it comes with a nine page PDF. It's great, isn't it great? Oh, it's, it's amazing. Great, yeah. <laughs> so go check that out if you want, it's totally free uh, for you. And um, yeah, thanks so much again to, Nate, to Nathan. Thanks to him for being on this. Oh, thanks for coming over. And yeah. You gave me a lesson right before this. It was, it was awesome. <laughs> thanks, man. Here Just here to help. All right, well, have a good day.